team, myself and uh, several of my researchers, are going to try to come back periodically throughout the course to assist Orion. Uh, Chris, I don't think we have that all nailed down yet, right? But um, what we're going to try to help Orion most with is kind of the big picture of uh, anaerobic digestion, how it works, some of the science. But we're not going to go very deep into the science, but uh, the science of it. Um, the second half of the course, which is more on, on the maintenance and operation and skills that are needed to be an operator at the facility, will be more for, focused on Orion and, and Angar and some of the other digesters that are in the area that will help with tours. Um, and I think we're going to get Angar people here for a lecture or two. Yeah. So, uh, I was one of the original writers of the grant with uh, BTC. Uh, we felt there was a USDA opportunity, a USDA uh, funding opportunity that was perfect for trying to get a course going to train uh, operators for anaerobic digesters on farms. So we need to do a shout out to USDA, um, their NIFA program uh, that funded BTC for the last couple of years to do this. Um, I have to have a shout out to Angar Corporation, who's been a partner on the grant, um, and I think as you get to know the Angar people, uh, I'd caution you to really uh, put forth your best foot because Angar now has hired four of the graduates of the earlier forms of this. Um, and every time they build another digester, they need another operator. <laughs> so whenever you see in the news a new Angar digester, just think that's a new job for a BTC graduate. So, I'm going to just do, again, some still pictures from this video to just get us discussing different things that you need to know about anaerobic digestion and, and the potential uh, operator job that you might be fulfilling. First thing is, this video talked about manure, but a digester can work with any kind of organic waste. So just spontaneously just start saying out loud some things, either kind of solidy or liquidy, that is an organic waste that you know starts to stink after a few days? Sewage. Sewage. Yard waste. Yard waste. Food waste, food, waste, food scraps. <laughs> Think industry too. I'm not surprised those are the first three because those are kind of stuff we deal with in our residential stuff. Uh, yard clippings, food waste, and our own sewage. So our trap grease. Trap grease. Cannery fish. Cannery fish waste. Is there anything in the pulp and paper industry? Pulp and industry, uh, paper pulp, or the pulp that's not, the waste pulp that's made in the process. Yep. Well, you guys think of sneaky things. <laughs> uh, like, I guess, wastewater from any industrial. From any process. industrial, just leave it more specific. What are some big Breweries. brewery? Brewery waste is huge. Every Anheuser Busch plant, every microbrewery makes a lot of waste. Liquid waste plus yeast waste. Rotten fruit. Rotten fruit from the industry up in, uh, we did our tour yesterday, um, the berry industry. All the berries that don't make the uh, ICQ uh, qualification, just waste berries, goes, can go into a digester and are going into a digester. Stinking milk. All of the byproducts of the milk industry, cheese whey, spilt milk, rotten milk, um, waste from the butter and cheese processing, uh, egg breakage, eggs that don't uh, make it through the quality control line. What about something at a, a large scale uh, meat processing? Huge, huge area for meat processing plants. Tons of waste material off of slaughterhouses, off of the actual uh, cuttings of the, at the meat processing facility. Have to be a little careful with some of the slaughterhouse things because we're worried about the, uh, the diseases from the spinal cord and the brain tissue. But other than that, very, very good putrescent material that would be great for a digester. Even blood. Blood. Use lots of blood, the slaughter from the blood, chicken feathers, hides from pigs, cows, 
Anything that's been slaughtered. <laughs> okay, I, pretty good. Um, I think you can get an idea that in the municipal area, the industrial area, the agricultural area, the food processing area, there are tons and tons and tons of waste, much of which is either going to a landfill or to our municipal wastewater treatment facilities through the sewer systems. What are some reasons why we do not want to send much of this to a landfill? Because it puts methane into our atmosphere, and when you burn methane like you do when you put it in a generator, it actually creates carbon. Okay. Carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide? Car carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, and that's a lot easier for okay. our, it has less of a shelf life than methane. That's better for our environment. Okay. Very, very well said. Huge key aspects there. I'll try to cover several of those things. Um, landfill is just burying it. Burying is not really much of a solution when you think about it. <laughs> Once you bury it, it's still going to rot. It's still going to stink. It's still going to produce gases. One of the gases being methane, which is 23, depends on which reference you use, 21, 23, 25 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. If it decomposes. Uh, no. It, Anaerobic. Yeah. You need an anaerobic area to, to make that methane, yeah. So, um, so landfills can be terrible for the greenhouse uh, climate change issues. It can be terrible for odor. Also, like when you were talking about the yard clippings, I think it's pretty obvious to all of you, when you take a pile of freshly cut uh, yard clippings and let it sit in your bin for three or four days in the hot weather, Notice that it kind of liquefies. You'll get a pile of liquid that stinks to high heaven at the bottom of it. Um, that's what's happening in the, the landfills. That it kind of breaks down and you get this liquid. That liquid has lots of bacteria, has nasty nutrients and chemicals in it. Where do you think that liquid ends up? Down in our water system, in our water supply. Um, we're trying to resolve our landfill problems by actually turning the landfills into anaerobic digesters. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that later in the, in the course. Um, another big problem about landfills is we just don't have much space to build new landfills. And even if we do have the space, the communities and counties and cities don't want it. So the state can't even build them anywhere. <laughs> I mean, they're not gonna come to Whatcom County and say, can we have a giant landfill for all of Seattle's waste? just not going to happen. Um, so we got to avoid landfills. Why wastewater treatment plant? Why do you think maybe we don't want them to go to the wastewater treatment plant? There are some reasons maybe why, but what would be some reasons why not? Well, you just kind of overload them, overwhelm them? You, you overwhelm them, definitely. Um, they only can take a certain amount of material, um, especially in rainy areas like Whatcom County. Um, and you're just increasing that load, not just only the load towards, in terms of volume, but the load in terms of all the content that's in it. And it just overwhelms it. You know, in Linden, they get a lot of dairy gold in their wastewater. And they, they have to really plan their day around what dairy gold puts in the system because they can get, it changes the whole chemical structure of the thing and the bugs and the whole ball of wax. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing. It is, yeah. Um, Remember that a wastewater treatment plant, because we'll get into this more, but a wastewater treatment plant works on the bugs. So you have to keep the bugs happy to make everything run smoothly. And if, the, if you upset the bugs, you're in trouble. And you upset the bugs just like you upset your stomach. If you eat things faster than you should, eat things that have more energy in it than it should, like eat five Big Macs all at one sitting, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, I'll give you a story. That dairy gold story is excellent, and, and you'll see that throughout the country, that they really have to watch. They have to base everything on the biggest industry in the city. Um, coming from Pullman and Washington State University, Pullman is a city of 20,000 during the summer, and then on August 15th, in a 24-hour period, it becomes a city of 40,000 <laughs> when all the students come. And then at an Apple Cup game, in a period of 24 hours, it becomes a city of 60,000. 
or 70,000. And at halftime of a football game, everyone goes and flushes their toilet. So wastewater, Pullman wastewater treatment plant is a treatment plant that probably more than any city in the United States is susceptible to complete destruction of their bugs <laughs> in a half hour period of time. Uh, and they have to adapt to that. Um, another big one about the wastewater treatment plants is that they, they charge Dairy Gold to put the stuff in their sewer. So from Dairy Gold's perspective, it's not, it, they're losing money trying to use the wastewater treatment plant. If they could kind of develop their own waste tr wastewater treatment plant, yes, it would cost them money to build it, to operate it, but maybe potentially make money off of that wastewater treatment plant. In the long run, they actually might be cash positive as opposed to be cash negative by constantly using the city's supplies. And what you're seeing across, California has been excellent about this, is they will actually incentivize a company like Dairy Gold to do exactly that. They will say, we'll pump in, a we'll give you a zero interest loan or something like that, or a 1% loan, because it's just good for Dairy Gold and it's good for the city. Is Gallows like that in Merced? And, is, exactly. Gallows. Um, uh, interesting you said Gallo because right now I'm doing some tests for Gallo on their manure to do a brand new yeah, digester. The Joseph Gallo one in Brazil? Said, yep. The reason I say that is I'm from that area. Okay. And then there's the giant um, onion processing facility not far from Merced. Yeah, you can smell it on the way. Yeah. They made their own digester in the city, helped pay f or gave them loans for that to get it done. Yeah. I was just going to say for the wastewater treatment, if a wastewater treatment plant fails, it fails spectacularly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is right? Right. Um, okay, so we want to try to avoid uh, landfills. We want to try to avoid overwhelming the wastewater treatment facilities. What are some other ways that, uh, maybe on that picture, that we can treat that material? Not getting to an anaerobic digester yet. We'll say that's our other last one. Burn it. Burn it, incineration. Spokane is your big city in Washington State that incinerates most of their garbage and um, much of their organic waste. Um, Skagit did? Okay. Um, now, what's the problem with incineration? Emissions. Emissions. Um, especially if they're incinerating garbage, which they tend to do, that um, it's kind of a combination of the organic material that you guys all mentioned, plus plastic bags and consumer type garbage. In the plastics and stuff are chlorines and mercury and heavy metals, and it's difficult to trap those in the stacks, and, and they're getting out into the air. Many of the cities along the Canadian border that used to do incineration, like Minneapolis, might have been what Skagit, I don't know, but Minneapolis was like that, is the Canadians just said, this is enough. <laughs> um, There's so much mercury coming out of those smokestacks and following the lakes and rivers of Canada that they just came down hard on the United States and said, you just need to stop incinerating, particularly with cities along the border. Not exactly sure how Spokane is able to keep going, but um, it got so bad that I, I lived in Minneapolis, or in Minnesota for a long time, it got so bad that you could only eat two walleyes a week. If you went more than two walleyes a week, you're exceeding your daily mercury consumption. You're not supposed to eat that here. Yeah, either. Same. I one. One? Two fish. Two fish. Oh, no, no, no. No. Um, okay, incineration. Um, maybe because of air emissions, we'll try to avoid that. Another one that's on that picture. It's composting. Composting. Composting doesn't work so great for a lot of the liquid stuff that you described, which is many in your list, but it works for some of the, uh, the bigger stuff like the lawn tripping, trimmings, the yard trimmings. Um, Negatives about compost. Doesn't it like take a while and you gotta have 
Yep. Yeah. Long process could be 45, 60, 80 days. Lots of energy. And that's the last thing I want to talk about all of these things. Energy. Landfills take lots of energy to get it to that distance site. It takes a lot of energy because you're constantly moving trucks around to move it, bury it, unbury it. Um, just very energy intensive. Wastewater treatment plants, extremely energy intensive. And the reason is because they are an aerobic process. An aerobic process means they're going to use bugs that want to live off of oxygen. To make it go fast, because you want all these things to go fast, you want the bugs to grow extremely fast. The way you make bugs go extremely fast is you give them an extreme amount of oxygen. The only way you can give them an extreme amount of oxygen is to give them an extreme amount of air. The only way you get an extreme amount of air is to have giant blowers. Giant blowers that are thousands of horsepower working 24-7. Compost is an aerobic process too. So not only are they using lots of trucks to move it around, they're having to do aerobic air systems too, 24-7. That brings us to anaerobic. Anaerobic does not want air. In fact, it wants zero air, zero oxygen in it. So you don't want you don't need to have these giant blowers, these giant aeration systems. If you build lots of them, then you don't have to haul long distance. So there's the potential there for making lots of savings, fuel savings, air blower kind of savings. But there's some negatives. And we'll come back to this in a little bit more detail, but we're just kind of hitting it at the surface here. The negatives are that anaerobic tends to anaerobic bacteria grow slower and it makes the whole process slower. At a wastewater treatment plant, they're growing bacteria so fast that they're treating a, all that waste within hours, within like an hour. At these digesters, it's taking 20 days. It's, it's just that much slower. And that means bigger facilities and more capital costs. Um, Aerobic organisms are like us, and that their waste, their main waste product is CO2. CO2. And CO2 doesn't stink. It's not too bad. It's got some climate problems. Um, anaerobic organisms, they have very different waste products. One which is very fortunate for us, <laughs> others that aren't fortunate, one of their waste products is methane. And that's what allows maybe making money, making energy as, as opposed to using energy, making money as opposed to spending money. But they make other chemicals like hydrogen sulfide, which is the chemical in rotten eggs. Um, so the smell can be kind of bad. Um, like anything in this world, none of the solutions are ever perfectly ideal. And that's why you have to have a suite of different technologies. We're going to need landfills. I just would prefer to have the organic material be separated out first and just leave the other stuff to go into the landfill. But that costs money and labor and infrastructure to separate it out. Once we separate out, we're still going to need wastewater treatment facilities, particularly for the very liquidy waste. We're going to want compost facilities for the very high solid-like material. And we might and we'll want anaerobic digesters at sites like breweries and farms and that ha produce enough waste that they can afford to have their own digester. I'm also going to bring up what's the number one, what's the, one of the biggest companies in the country that deals with waste and has it in their name? Waste Management, waste management WM. Um, WM has some bold plans. We'll see if it ever occurs. The bold plan is basically way, the way waste management works across the country is they go collect it with their trucks and then after they collect it at individual sites, they take them to transfer stations. And waste management right now is in the process of trying to see if they can cross the country, cross the world, move their transfer plants to such a way that they are separating out the organics or separating it out much better. And during that separation, they will actually blend and purify the, the organics into a 
a, um, standard size standard material. it's uh, it's more like uh, oatmeal kind of a puree material and then their plan is that that puree will be sent to any local digester to try to reduce fuel costs if, if there's a dairy that happens to be kind of near it's going to the dairy if there's a municipal wastewater treatment plant that's not being overloaded it'll go there if there's an Anheuser Busch plant that's not being overloaded it can take some it'll go there um, that's an interesting plan that uh, I'd like to see take off because it'll help facilitate digesters and have this kind of uh, community feel to it. Will it kind of like uh, exchange credits or something with everybody? Or, you know what I mean? If you're bringing something to them, there's got to be some benefit to them, right? Exactly. Uh, okay, good. It's, um, so I think the waste management uh, business model has to be still developed a little bit but from what I'm inferring or heard so let's say they're willing to actually help that dairy or that Anheuser Busch plant get a little bit of extra infrastructure to be able to handle that new material maybe with a 0% loan or a 1% loan or maybe even be a little bit of an equity owner in the process um, waste management because they work all on tipping fees is probably still gonna charge the tipping fee so that's where waste management gets happy they unload their product they get their tipping fee the tipping fee maybe offsets that initial investment that they put in gets paid back each one of those digesters that receives it gets to make more electricity and gets to make way more electricity because later in, in this course we'll find out that food waste has a lot of energy in it a lot more than manure so you can double triple quadruple your electricity so that's their benefit Alluding to this uh, presentation, there's a hidden negative there that might screw up this whole plan. Is waste management isn't just moving the waste material to someone else, it's moving the nutrients to someone else. Now that dairy has all that extra nitrogen and phosphorus, and that Anheuser Bush has all that extra nitrogen and phosphorus in the wastewater treatment plant. And on one hand, we view nitrogen and phosphorus as a positive. That's what the world grows on, lives off of. But to many of these industries, it's a negative to, because to maintain rules and regulations, they have to treat it, and it's so expensive to treat. So that's a big negative. Do you ever see, like, a, if a community or neighborhood, would it be feasible for them to kind of collect their own stuff and make their own little anaerobic digester and then... Maybe could you use methane to heat your home or something like that? Is, there, is that too far out there? Okay. Um, so, so in China and India and Vietnam, Colombia, all the countries along the equator that are developing countries or historically have been developing countries, they've been extremely successful in developing community or single household digesters. And small little digesters that aren't any bigger than this table that treats the human waste from a four-person family and one cow. Well, would you be able to generate enough uh, methane to cook off of or say generate yeah. uh, enough electricity to probably use one light or right. TV or something? Okay, so that's the one I'm about to get to. And, and what I'm alluding to to your answer, it's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, it's, it's going to be difficult in the United States. <laughs> and I'll show why. In those developing countries in the equator, it sort of works for these reasons. The bacteria want to be at body temperature. If you're in the equator, you don't have to add heat or anything. You just got the natural body temperature. Number two, you're only going to make a little bit of methane. You're not going to make a whole lot of methane. And it's going to be dirty methane. It's not going to be it's, it's dirty biogas. It has that rotten egg smell. And, um, so in the developing world, because none of them, well, most of them do not have natural gas lines going into their house. So the only way they cook is to take wood from the, and have wood stoves. Well, all the wood supply is going away, or that's causing air quality concerns. So the country really wants them to, or incentivize them to build these. Well, they'll get a little small plastic bladder. That's all it is. It's a, piece of plastic that will store a day's supply 
of methane. As this kind of slowly, constantly makes a little methane, it'll store it. And at five o'clock when dinner comes, there'll be enough methane for that dinner to cook dinner. And they'll use stoves that can, are very, in one sense you could say poorly designed stoves, but on the other hand, they're very nicely designed stoves that they can handle the dirty biogas. Um, and the injectors and stuff don't get corroded. Um, and that's basically how they utilize it to cook. They do not do it to make electricity because as you guys know, to electricity, then you gotta have an engine, you gotta have a generator, and then that's way off of your scale. So it's all about cooking. Now go to the United States. We all have natural gas lines, go, well, not all of us, and some rural areas don't, but most of us have the natural gas lines coming in. So why would you spend all this time to build a small digester, collect your waste, which Americans typically don't like to do that dirty work, to make a little bit of methane that actually won't run very well off of your modern equipment. Um, and the natural gas is so cheap, so we're just not set up to really do that. What I would expand on your idea is kind of like the waste management, but at a smaller scale. I think communities should get together and, uh, and collect and then work with the waste management to get that to a bigger collection site deal with it. Two things. To go off the North American communities collecting stuff, how, how much of a, like if you're just collecting methane in the tank, if you're, if he's collecting it, he's collecting it, and we all bring it together, is there a safety risk with a whole bunch of regular Joes collecting tanks full of methane and bringing them together? Like is that, is that an, uh, an obstruction, I guess? Yes. Yeah, so when I was saying, I think we should collect the rotten food material. Oh, okay. And put it into one. Yeah. Okay. It, collecting the gas okay. yeah. would, exactly said, would be <laughs> real problematic. Exactly yeah. And then yeah. to go back to something you said a few minutes ago, with the waste management putting their stuff at, at dairy gold and then having excess nitrogen and uh, phosphorus, how expensive is it, or is there a technology? Because that's what we make commercial fertilizers out of, correct? Yes. How hard is it, how late, like how capital intensive, I guess, is it to get that excess nitrogen and phosphate at Anheuser Busch turned into fertilizer? Is it prohibitively expensive? And to be honest, that, that's what my whole professor career has been based on, is I'm trying to do that. <laughs> I, I, I do anaerobic digestion, but I've recognized that one of the big problems about anaerobic digestion is this nutrient thing. So for the last five years, it's exactly what I've been trying to do, is how can you take existing technologies about taking dilute forms of nitrogen and phosphorus and making commercial fertilizer and doing it at, in an economic way. Sure, Exxon can do it. You know, Exxon's one of the biggest producers of fertilizer and they produce them at their refineries because they got cheap source of energy. And, um, but can you do it at a, at a scale one thousandth or one ten thousandth that scale? And I'd say the answer right now is we're, we're on the cusp of maybe being able to do that. But we're not there yet. Oh. Um, Okay, let's talk about digesters themselves a little bit. Um, if you start feeling, okay, maybe this is a positive thing. Maybe we can take this waste material and avoid all those other sources or uses. Try to go anaerobic digestion because it can be energy positive. You have to still build these things. You have to get them to work. So take the name, anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic, just fancy way of saying, no oxygen present. Digestion, fancy way for saying, bacteria need to eat it. So if you were going to, except even if you were in the developing world, don't even talk about super complex ones, if you were gonna develop a system, uh, a structure that could allow you to have no oxygen and a home for bacteria to eat, 
What are the structure that you need? At its simplest, this starts very simple. What kind of structure do you have to have? Concrete basin. It could be you have to have some kind of some kind of reservoir, some kind of enclosed uh, building that can hold liquidy, solidy material. That's number one. So, and I like it could be concrete, it could be steel, it could be a clay basin, it could just be a membrane. It could be lots, lots of stuff. It just has to be an enclosed structure. Number one. Pump or something. Okay, and let's think about that. Is the, you, so you might want to remove the oxygen, but that could be costly. Or okay. a valve for it to escape. Or a valve for it to escape, or let's do some of your mechanic. Were you about to get an answer on that one? Or something else? I'll call you on that in a bit. What's a cheap way? So let's say you have a, uh, a, a plastic bladder, and it's empty. So it's got all this air and all its oxygen in it. What's a cheap, you almost had the answer. What's a cheap way to make sure all of that air is gone? Fill it up. <laughs> Just fill it with whatever liquid you want because that liquid as it fills up is just gonna kick out the air. Sure, you don't wanna fill it completely to the top because you are already guessing that as that stuff rots, it's gonna start producing gas. And if you filled it completely, there's no room for the gas. So you gotta have a little bit of area up there. What we do in the laboratory is I actually take a canister of nitrogen gas and I just blow nitrogen gas in it and kick out that remaining air and it's filled with nitrogen. But in the real world, like in China, um, they don't do that. They, they know that there's, sure there's some air there, but they know quickly enough gas is gonna be produced to just within a day push out that air. So that's their cheap version of doing it. Where would that air go? Like, will it just displace it out of valve? Or, or it, it needs to come out of valve. It's got to, okay. and then we'll talk about here about how we got to have some valve. So, so number one, we've got a container that could be built out of pretty much anything. You've got the great idea that we've got to pump it in. Okay, so you probably, if you want to save money, you either your gravity flows in. Well, that's what China is going to do. Here, either gravity or pump. So you got it in there. What else do you have to be able to do? Yeah, you got to keep it warm. Okay, so you, we know we've got the equator people that just do it for free. We can try to bury it in the ground to try to help, uh, which most, you see a lot of these digesters are built in the ground. Or you could burn natural gas or burn propane or use electricity to Heat it up, but that's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. On the, uh, let's talk about those. I'll just do that one first, and then you. Is that? Yes, decomposition produces its own heat. For us chemists, it's exothermic, produces its own heat. I told you that anaerobic grow slow, aerobic grow fast. Since anaerobic grow slow, they produce very little heat. Aerobic, because they grow fast, produce a lot of heat. That's why when you, if you've probably been in a compost pile, you put your hand into a compost pile, you, if it's a good compost pile, you want to remove that hand. <laughs> That's how warm that compost, because the aerobic is just cranking out heat. So yes, an aerobic process will give us a little bit of heat, but unfortunately it doesn't give us quite the heat we need to get to a good body temperature. So you can use a fraction of your methane to, to burn and get heat, put it through a boiler, however you want to do, and maintain heat. So now you have our first, so now we have a couple auxiliary systems. We have a tank, we have a pump, we have, have to have a way to recycle some of the methane, we have to be able to burn it, put in a boiler, we have to have a milk tank to, to have that recycle of water for heating, starting to get more complex. Another huge thing, it's, are you constantly making waste at the facility, wherever you're at, the brewery, the farm, okay. So what's one big flaw in our system right now? Balance? 
once? I mean, coming in, coming out? Coming in, coming out. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe, from my perspective in the laboratory, that's one of our hardest, I was talking to Orion, uh, one of our hardest things is it's easy to gravity feed, gravity feed in, but then you need to pump it out or gravity feed out, but you got to use a U-tube or some kind of thing because you can't have it designed so that it just slides right, sl slides right out, you know. Uh, you have to have, and you have to have a gas trap because remember we have to have this be gas tight. So you have to be able to pump in, pump out, or gravity in, gravity out while maintaining gas tightness and a certain liquid level. That's harder than it seems, especially at a laboratory scale. Commercial, they know how to do that. But. Does it settle and layer itself? How do you know what you're pumping out is Excellent. done with what uh, excellent, excellent, because now I just told you what I think was the first big problem is trying to go in out. Second is it will settle. It will stratify. If you start pumping out just the liquid at the top, let's say you've designed it so only the really liquidy settled stuff is always pumped out, within a month what's your container going to look like? It's just going to be full of dry material. Probably you know, in the case of dairies, uh, coming in with their feet is, is sand and gravel. It's just naturally in there. The blow sand that's coming in, the cows walking and kicking. Those digesters will, within a year, be completely full of sand unless you have a way to make sure that that sand is all even homogenous and it's moving the sand out. Um, so, so you've got to be able to, you probably want to, your exits want to take from the bottom, but more than just from the bottom, you need to have some kind of mixing. You have to agitate. Now, you know the second you agitate, you, you could do it very expensively, take a lot of energy, or you could do it cheap way or somewhere in the middle. Uh, China. A household in China, developing country. What do you think they do to solve the mixing problem? They just stir it. But does the human stir it? Is the drum the surge thing? Does it rotate? Can they like turn a crank and rotate the Yes, they rotate it. But is it the human that rotates the drum? It's the cow. <laughs> so the cow just keeps moving in a circle. <laughs> or the horse or whatever it is. Or what you quickly find out you don't need to do it 24-7. Bugs don't have to be so uh, constantly mixed. And so maybe you get the cow to just rotate it one hour a day. And you pick that hour, you know, maybe, maybe at the end of that hour is that where you purposely feed so that once you feed, that's what's coming out. So you know what's coming out is homogenous. Save some money that way. So you have your outlet and it's continuously pumping, if you're pumping in stuff, it pumps out stuff. Yes. So where is okay. the uh, dry animal bedding and the phosphorus and the nitrogen coming from in the very end when it's all dry and done with its bacteria and stuff? Is that just being pumped out? What are you, what are you doing with that? How is, it, how is it going from the liquid to the, to the dry? Okay. I'm missing the in-between stuff. Right. So... First of all, the, it's a liquid, it's a, because there's different types of digesters we have to get to, but for now we'll say it's a liquidy digester, liquidy material going in. It should be a liquidy material coming out if it was homogenous. Um, that liquid material still has to be dealt with. Um, and let's, it's a great question, but it's, it's one that's very long, that's a whole section that we need to talk about. We'll get to that. Um, yeah. Okay, um, where were we though? Uh, we got the auxiliary heating stuff, we've got the mixing. Oh, let's talk about if it's not China. Let's say a little bit more modern developing world in the U.S. How are we going to mix? Yeah, motor, impeller. Okay. And many, many digesters use just a motor impeller. Now, they've gotten creative over the years. It used to be that it was just right down the center, big, huge impeller, 
just that had the width of the digester itself and just it's like a cement mixer. Overbuilt, too much energy. They started changing it now. Some of the better, really good designs coming out of Switzerland. It's more like a little prop propeller on a fishing boat. It's just a tiny little propeller about this big that's on a rod on the side of the digester. And it's just a automation that just, that's constantly spinning, but then it's slowly moving up and down and angling over the time. And just that constant movement is able to keep the whole thing mixed with a small propeller and keep the horsepower way down. Does it run vertically or horizontally? It run, it, it's running vertically, but they, while it's running vertically, it's changing its angle. And they might have like two, and they kind of, sometimes they're offsetting the, the vortex of the two so that the two work together and end up getting a, yeah. Just enough to maintain that vortex? Just, yeah. And now, and let's, let's talk about this, we're designed, okay. What is, there's, I'd say there's two reasons why we're mixing. What are we trying to get the mixing? Well, let's do three. What are the way the mixing is trying to solve? You've already said the one. We want to keep it from being stratified. And, and that's the one that takes the most amount of power. For example, the heaviest thing that you're going to find in there is probably sand or rocks. You want to suspend them. If you're going to try to suspend a rock, you're going to spend way too much energy. So that. So maybe you design it that all I want to make sure is that this size sand particle gets suspended. The, beyond suspending the sand, you want to make sure the bacteria can get to new food. So the bacteria, you're kind of moving the bacteria around with, so they come in contact with food. And this is why you don't want to try to suspend rocks, because if you're spend, suspending rocks, it's going like this, and that's too much shear stress for the bacteria. You could actually kill or inhibit the bacteria. Um, third is you do not want temperature stratification. You don't want, like a lake, you don't want it to be 80 degrees here and 100 degrees here. That's going to be very bad for the bacteria. So I'd say temperature stratification, solid stratification, bacteria eating are all the reasons you want to mix. And you want to find a balance that allows all three of those to happen while keeping the energy low. And I'm already telling you that if you do that balance, you're going to end up with rocks sitting on the bottom. So how do you get rid of rocks? Can't you classify them or let them fall out somehow or filter them out? Tightly? Exactly. So maybe your first little compartment of the digester is, a, is just a little uh, settling tank that's designed to just settle out heavy particulates. And then you've designed that tank that very easily, once a month, you can just scoop it out of there or use some kind of mechanism to scoop that material out. Maybe it's before the digester. There's uh, sand settling lanes or rock settling lanes before it even gets in there. Just out of curiosity, are there a lot of difficulties with uh, mechanics inside of the anaerobic digester, like regularly? Mm -hmm. have to go knee deep in the okay. Now, this is a great point because we're kind of getting it with these rocks and stuff. Is um, do you want to have all of these things, the heating, the mixing, um, the biogas? Do you want all of that stuff, pipes and material, on the inside, or do you all want it on the outside? So she's saying that let's say you've got all these heating pipes and you've got mixers, propellers, they're all in the inside. Once you put them all in the inside, if something breaks, yeah, then you gotta you're go shut down. down, you have to drain, you have to wear OSHA approved equipment to go in there. That's something you do not want to ever do, really, ever do. So there are digester designers that try to do everything they can that anything mechanical or piping is on the outside. There's others that say we're going to do it on the inside because we're confident that there's so few moving parts, we've designed it right, that that's not a problem to us. But either way they do it, you're going to have to have what's called cleanouts. And what we're getting is the cleanouts could be, some could be up front, like sand letting, settling lanes, some could be uh, 
settling pits. Others could be, you've probably seen, we're going to have some more pictures, digesters, the tanks. You can just have a bottom port at the bottom to try to pull out some. Um, this one, they actually can take the cover off, and it's called a skid steer pit, and they'll actually put a skid steer in there and clean it out. They avoid it with all possibility. Other one is they might once a year, they'll have ports here. Once a year, they'll put in a big roots blower. And they'll just really mix it and just wash everything out and get rid of the rocks. Okay, um, okay so you've got tank, you've got heating, you've got mixing, you've got pumping in, you've got pumping out, you've got gas tight, uh, you've got safeties, you've got clean outs. You've got design of, is it going to be interior or exterior? You've got in the design trying to re reduce the amount of mechanical parts, which here's talk about this one, still on mixing. You guys gave an idea of an impeller is one way to mix. Any other thoughts of how else you could mix? A screw? Okay. It could be a, a, a screw, yeah. In fact, there are digesters that use a, a screw along the length. You know, if it's a vertical tank, impeller works great. If it's a horizontal tank, it's a screw or paddles. Yeah. Um, but it'll be a little bit more creative. I'm not going to allow you to use a motor. Uh, well, a motor in, to run any kind of paddle or impeller. Can't use, you can't vibrate, can you? Okay, when you're that. Yeah. It shouldn't yes. wouldn't be enough. Gas. Use the yeah. So you already were using the gas to heat. Why not use a portion of the gas to mix? You just take the gas and put it down to the bottom of the digester and put it through a nozzle. It mixes it. The neat thing about that gas, the gas to heat, you've actually wasted gas to heat. You've had to use it. This gas is still yours. You still get to use it to run your engine. You're just borrowing it for a moment. Are you just taking the methane and pumping it back through? Yeah, the, the biogas, the full biogas. Okay, whatever pumping it, through. it is composed of at that point, you're not really concerned about that, right? You just kind of get it movement through there? Exactly. And almost uh, five of the six digesters in, no, seven of the eight, I got to get them right, seven of the eight digesters in Washington State use a patent to design that's biogas mixing. And they, the, the patent, you might think, how can they get patent? All you're doing is taking biogas and putting it on the bottom and putting it through a nozzle. They've done it a very creative way so that they get a, a very nice pattern of mixing. Without a compressor? Is it, is they need to, no, they need a compressor. Um, okay, again, uh, wonderful question. So you, you've, I've already alluded that you have a little bit of headspace. Uh, where the gas is going to start to develop and build up. At a certain point, it, you're going to make so much gas that the pressure is going to increase. If you don't design it properly, that increase in pressure is just going to blow whatever lid you have off. So let's discuss how are we going to correctly, efficiently let the gas build up, but then let it release. Pressure release valve. Typically, these digesters are on two to four inches of water column. They don't have very much pressure. It's just a little bit of pressure. As soon as it gets past four inches of water column, it's up. Okay? And then once it releases it, where's that gas going? Now you don't want the bio. You Okay, so you capture it, and it would probably be sent to an engine. But an engine doesn't want to operate on three to four inches of water column, so you have to send it through a compressor, a booster. And you, that's what I'm getting to. So some will go to the engine, but some will go back in to be mixed. You want that to go through a booster, too, because you're not going to get much mixing off of two to four inches of water column mixing. So you boost it up to close to one PSI. 20, what is it, 24, 25 inches of water column, you're boosting it up to. Okay. Do the anaerobic digesters have to be 
public digesters that you've worked on, do they run constantly? Or does somebody go out and turn them on? And they are constantly run. Like the, you're constantly generating electricity with the generator, the methane's constantly pushing it in. Correct, 24-7. And that's a beautiful thing for our power grid. Why is our power grid extremely happy that digesters make power 24-7? Can sell it back. Can sell it back, but what are, what are some of their other sources of energy that do not make 24-7? Wind, okay, solar. We've gotten such a big supply of wind here in Washington State that they're starting to have a very difficult time managing the grid. Um, so you'd think that they'd want a lot of digesters to be that base load to offset wind. We'll find out later that some, one of the reasons why I don't think we have enough digesters in this country is some of the power companies have been less than happy to help us build digesters. Why do you think that would be the case if, you, if I've already told you that it would be great for them to have a base load to offset wind? <laughs> There's some money, and, but where are these ones we want to build them? These, these guys, rural areas. So what does the power company have to do to get, they have to have the transfer stations and they have to have the, the relays and anyway, so sometimes they can be less than friendly to get these projects done. Um, I'm going to get to safeties. You almost brought up safeties. Um, I'll come back to mixing a little bit is, so the gas came out, there was a little pressure release valve. What if we fed it really rich food, made a lot of biogas, it's flying out of that pressure release valve, but it's flying out faster than the engine can take it? Storage. Storage, so we could have a whole separate storage. But that's extra money to build a whole extra storage facility. So what could you do this one's kind of tricky. See if you come up with it. What could you do that could allow you to store the gas a little bit better, but not have to have a completely separate storage facility? You already talked about recycling through the... Recycling helps you a little bit, but that's just the extra volume of the pipe. Not very much. Running it back through the whole digester, you already worried about your gas? Yeah. Okay. This one's pretty... I don't know if you get that. Is have any type of flexible membrane? You got it. You can have a floating cover or a flexible membrane. This is becoming more and more important because if you can design it to have a floating hard cover or a flexible membrane, you could get storage up to a whole day, kind of like China did, but at a very, very large scale. Why in our modern grid system, would it be conducive to you, if you want to make money, why would it be conducive to you that you could store biogas for up to 24 hours? You want to sell during the peak. You want to sell during the peak hours. Washington might give you a price of three or four cents per kilowatt hour, but California, if it's peak hours, might give you 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So you burn all of your biogas during a three hour period. <laughs> You store it for 21 other hours. Okay. This is where business plans start impacting your design. Hey, uh, let's go back to more safety. So, so let's say we're not going to do extra storage. Or if we did extra storage, we're still making more biogas that the storage can handle and the engine can handle. <laughs> That'd be an answer, which, because in the long run, that you're going to make money. If you're, if you're making that all 24-7, uh, but let's, let's say this was a rare occurrence, a rare occurrence, so it's not going to be cost effective for you to, to get another engine. What would happen on this rare occurrence? What would be the catastrophic event? Boom, or blow, you'd have an explosion or you'd blow off the lid. So you've got to avoid that. What's the answer to that? Yeah, what? You have a burn off. You have a flare. Okay, so how are you going to design your flare? You have a pressure relief valve that's at 4 psi to let it out of the container. You have a booster that's at uh, 25 water column to get it to the engine. What are you going to 
What's the simple control you're going to put on your flare? You have to add pressure? Yeah, you need what, 27, 26? Okay, so you, you know, again? If it's at 26, I'm the gas. I want to head towards the engine at 25. But now the engine can't take me anymore. It's just backing up. Because it's backing up, what's the pressure just before I get to the engine? 25, 26, 27. If there's a flare over here that's at 26, where am I going to go? I'm going to go here. Do we want to release just methane to the air? OK, so what does your flare have to make sure it can do? It's got to burn. So how do you tell it to burn? So how do you know when to ignite it? Do you want to just keep it ignited all the time? I mean, there's. Well, would the pressure take on a, some kind of a spark? There you go. Once the you have a pressure that once that pressure relief valve goes, then you give an electronic igniter and it goes. Could you use your extra gas to heat your anaerobic digester? I guess it wouldn't be constant. Okay. Now some, it, you kind of answered your question already, but some will put in an extra boiler just to utilize that to get some extra hot water. Craig, has anyone set up like a, um, a tank full of water that's above their flares, so the flares heating the water that can go into the digester? Not that I've seen on that one. So no. We might be able to utilize Why is the it? flare heat. Well, that's kind of like, I don't know if it has to be above, but I would, you could send it to a small little boiler unit that's not too expensive. Um, Right. How much you're making and make sure that your levels right. Yep. Be a lot of uh, variables. Um, one more with mixing. Um, okay, so you guys came up with impeller motors. You came up with biogas recirculation. There is one other interesting way to mix. Doesn't involve the gas. Doesn't involve a mechanical thing spinning. Can save you money. It's utilizing something you already have. I have faith in you. You guys have come up with great answers already. You great room of engineers here. Would it involve having another uh, digester and circulating between the two? Oh, and I, you pretty much have it. Is you're pumping in liquid, right? right. Why not pump the liquid in through a nozzle? that let's say you have a circular tank, why not pump it in so that it's angled and it just uses the flow of the tank? I always try to find a free way to do things. <laughs> All right. So you will see, I think you've, we've kind of covered digest. I'll show some pictures here. You, you will see vertical tanks. You will see horizontal tanks. You will see tanks that have Hard covers. You will see tanks that have hard covers that can float up. You will see tanks that have flexible covers. You will see tanks that mix with slurry, mix with gas, mix with impeller. You will see digesters that don't heat at all in China, others that do heat using it with methane um, that you run through a boiler. Um, you've got all the different digester designs. Okay. Now, what, if you're in the industry, what you, if you go to a show, this company's saying, my design's the best, theirs are terrible. <laughs> this company's saying, my design's the best, theirs is terrible. It depends okay. on the application. It depends on the application. Now I'm going to bring up dairy manure because, you know, I, where I spend most of my time is we deal, do, uh, build digesters for dairy manure. Has everyone seen the dairy manure produced on a farm? Not just the as-is dairy manure coming out of the rear end, but the dairy manure after they've done manure management scrape system. Okay, so scrape dairy manure, help me with the adjectives. Uh, it's very watery. Um, I'm, I'm going to use a word that we'll define later in the afternoon. It's total solids. It's 8% total solids. Imagine you took, you guys got to help me out. Um, took a, a very, very thin oil, 
and added 20% of its volume with grass clippings. Shook that up. That's what scraped dairy manure looks like. Brown, slightly viscous, with big chunks of grass in it. Okay? There's many people that design digesters for human waste. Okay? Human waste after it's gone through the toilet system and through our sewer system is extremely watery. I told you that dairy manure is 8% solids. Human waste will be 1% solids. And there won't be chunks of grass. Okay? So let's take two different wastes then. You've got something that's just human waste is basically just colored water. And you've got dairy manure that's viscous with big fraction of fiber grass in it. There's some designs you don't want to use. One thing that we didn't talk about is, I told you anaerobic systems are extremely slow. So people have constantly figured, how, how can we try to make this go faster? Well, the may, way you make it go faster is to have more anaerobic bacteria. If you have 10 times the amount of anaerobic bacteria, then you're going to go 10 times faster. But how do you get 10 times the anaerobic bacteria? And just one thing here is that when you put manure in, and the manure is being eaten by the bacteria, and the bacteria is growing. As the manure comes out, what else comes out? The bacteria. So you have to start all over. <laughs> you have to start growing new bacteria. So if you had a way to get rid of the waste, but keep the bacteria, you could get 10 times the amount of bacteria and go 10 times as fast, and instead of taking 20 days, take two days. They know how to do that. They build little tiny houses <laughs> inside the digester. It's just little pieces of plastic material that just are suspended in the digester, and the bacteria uh, just naturally produce a, a, a film that gets them to stick to the plastic. And as the food just hydraulically goes by, they just munch on it and eat on it, and they got their nice little home. Okay. Why is that not? going to work with dairy manure, but it might work with human manure. Too thick and too What's going to get attached to that piece of plastic? The fiber. <laughs> okay. So what we had when people started uh, building digesters on dairy farms, we had people from municipal going, oh, this is the digester you need to build. It's only two days retention versus 20 days retention. It's 10 times smaller. It's more cost effective. It's the way to go. And then within a year, it's completely clogged and failed. And everyone's swearing and yelling and suing each other. Okay? So you have to come up with a digester that's unique to your waste material. So when you go to a show and someone says, ours is the best, they're probably right. There's a reason why they're the best. But they're the best for a particular reason. Okay. There really are only three digesters that you will see on a dairy farm. One is this, which is called a covered lagoon. And here's why they build a covered lagoon. At most dairies, they already have these giant lagoons. They've had to have them because they had to store the manure during the winter and then wait till the spring that they could apply their manure. So they've already got their vessel. <laughs> it's a clay-lined vessel, but they already have their vessel. The only thing they have to do to make it uh, a sealed container is just put a cover over it. The cover is a little bit more complex than you might think because they got to make sure it's all gas tight here. Uh, it's got to be able to withstand the, the ultraviolet light and a farm situation. Um, it's got to have some insulating properties so that you can main temp maintain temperature. You've got to put some, sometimes they don't increase the temperature because a lot of times these are being only built in California where they don't need to heat. But if they were going to heat, they'll have to put some external piping that injects some hot manure in or preheats the manure. Lots of things you do, but basically it's just a covered lagoon. Just put a cover to over an existing system. 
they purposely don't make them very complex. They're trying to make them as cheap as possible. Does their performance go down? Yeah, but they don't care that the performance goes down because it's, just a, it, it's offset by the fact that you made it so much cheaper. And it's starting to, people were going away from making covered lagoons in California because the performance wasn't as effective. But now they're getting more and more interest because the great thing about a covered lagoon is it has the floating. flexible floating top, which means that you can sell your electricity at peak hours. You know, Craig, since we're starting to get into uh, the types of digestion, this could be a good time to give these guys a little bit of a break. Yeah, well, I've been talking and okay. talking for a while. But just before your break, I want to tell you that what you did in a short period of time, and much more than... Uh, other students that I might teach. I end up, to be honest, I, I teach a lot of times students that want to become masters and PhDs, and they might be really good at their hard science, but they have no practical or mechanical experience whatsoever. <laughs> so they, they wouldn't come up with the rapid ideas you had here. And what we just did in the last hour and a half is you pretty much all on your own came up with exactly how you would design a vessel to do what we want it to do and what some of the strengths and weaknesses are. And that's going to be extremely beneficial to you when you become an operator on the farm. And you might be working at a farm that's a covered lagoon. You might be at one with a vertical tank or horizontal tank. But it doesn't matter to you because you know why each of those components are there. <laughs>